This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that exposes the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data sourced from the dark web that power solutions that proactively protect over 3 billion employees and consumer accounts worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. CISA issues a binding operational directive. An L.A. school district says ransomware operators missed most sensitive PII. An API protection report describes malicious transactions. We've got analysis of cyber risk in relation to software-as-a-service applications. Joe Kerrigan describes underground groups using stolen identities and deepfakes. Our guest is Eve Mailer from Forge Rock on consumer identity breaches. And someone is making a nuisance of themselves in Russia. From the Cyberwire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your Cyberwire summary for Tuesday, October 4th, 2022. Happy fiscal new year to all of our U.S. federal listeners. The first significant cyber policy of fiscal year 23 appeared yesterday. CISA opened the U.S. federal fiscal year with binding operational directive 23-01, improving asset visibility and vulnerability detection on federal networks. The directive specifies desired outcomes for asset visibility and vulnerability detection without prescribing the steps federal executive civilian agencies need to take to comply. The key compliance deadline is April 3, 2023, by which time the organizations falling under CISA's tutelage will be expected to, first, perform automated asset discovery every seven days, second, initiate vulnerability enumeration across all discovered assets, including all discovered nomadic or roaming devices, that means laptops, every 14 days. There's some wiggle room here for larger, more complex organizations, and CISA recognizes that it might not be possible to get full visibility in two weeks. Nonetheless, CISA says that enumeration processes should still be initiated at regular intervals to ensure all systems within the enterprise are scanned on a regular cadence within this window. Third, within six months of CISA publishing requirements for vulnerability enumeration performance data, all FCEB agencies are required to initiate the collection and reporting of vulnerability enumeration performance data as relevant to this directive to the CDM dashboard. These data are of interest to CISA as a means of automating its oversight and monitoring of agencies' scanning performance. And fourth, by April 3, 2023, agencies and CISA through the CDM program will deploy an updated CDM dashboard configuration that enables access to object-level vulnerability enumeration data for CISA analysts as authorized by the executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. Regular reporting will kick in at 6, 12, and 18-month intervals. Again, it's CISA's intention that the directive be understood as a mission order, that there are many ways agencies can comply, and the precise methods and procedures they choose are largely up to them. The Los Angeles Unified School District continues its recovery from the ransomware attack it first reported on September 5th, The Wall Street Journal reports that the district says that the data taken by the criminals did not include student or staff psychiatric records, as had been rumored. The district says that the compromised data included little information on students or staff. 
Sequence Security has published a report on API security, finding that 31% of the 16.7 billion observed malicious transactions in the first half of 2022 targeted unknown or unmanaged APIs, also known as shadow APIs. Sequence explains, Shadow APIs are a particularly pernicious threat that can be categorized as OWASP API9, improper asset management abuse. Shadow APIs are a common problem in organizations that do not have proper inventory on their quality assurance and development API endpoints or their versioning system, and attackers can easily discover API endpoints that will interact with production data. Shadow APIs can also appear when endpoints are coded to accept variables or wildcard inputs either with the uniform resource identifier path or at the end. Attackers are able to easily find shadow APIs by analyzing a production API, which may be well protected, then simply fuzz or modify the values, enumerating through other API endpoints on different versions under different host names, or simply accepting random characters at the end of the URI. The vast majority of malicious activity targeting APIs is powered by automation, for example, sneaker bots attempting to cop the latest dunks or Air Jordans, or stealthy attackers attempting a slow trickle of card testing fraud on stolen credit cards to pure brute force credential stuffing campaigns. Veronis released a report today detailing software as a service applications and the cyber risks associated with them. The researchers analyzed 15 petabytes of data across 717 organizations across a number of industries. The researchers found that about 81% of companies analyzed had sensitive SaaS data exposed to the whole Internet. The average company has 10% of cloud data exposed to every employee, 157 sensitive records exposed to the open Internet through SaaS sharing features, 33 super administrator accounts with over half of those accounts not utilizing multi-factor authentication, and just over 4,400 user accounts without multi-factor authentication. It was also discovered that there are over 40 million unique permissions across SaaS applications and over 12,000 Microsoft 365 sharing links. The most alarming statistic discovered was that 6% of an organization's cloud data was exposed to the entire Internet. On average, each terabyte of data in an organization's cloud seems to contain more than 6,000 sensitive files with nearly 4,000 folders shared with contacts outside of the organizations with more than 2.1 million permissions. Microsoft 365 was also found to be a treasure trove of exposure with 7% of companies having more than 10,000 exposed files. Alarmingly, there were 10 analyzed companies that had over 100,000 exposed files. Even more startling... One company had more than 1.5 million files exposed in Microsoft 365. In full disclosure, we note that Microsoft is a partner of the CyberWire, and we also note that this exposure is a matter of user configuration, not of vulnerabilities in the software itself. SecureWorks' State of the Threat report for 2022 is out, and it shares the widespread assessment that the effect of Russian cyber operations in the war against Ukraine has been confined to a nuisance level, stating, The war against Ukraine has been revealing for Russia's cyber capabilities. At the outset of the conflict, there were wide fears of destructive attacks with wide-scale repercussions, as was seen with NotPetya in 2017. However, despite a steady cadence of cyber activity directed against Ukrainian targets, some of which is identifiably from Russian government-sponsored threat actors, no widely disruptive attacks have been successful. The most visible Russian threat group tracked by the CTU over the past year has been Iron Tilden. This group is notable for spear phishing attacks conducted primarily against Ukraine, but also against Latvia's parliament in April. And finally, if Russian hacking has been a nuisance as opposed to a war winner— much the same can be said of hacking directed at Russian targets. In a communique delivered to the Kiev Post, the National Republican Army, a group that identifies itself as a popular Russian organization 
devoted to the overthrow of President Putin's regime, said that it has executed a ransomware attack against Unisoftware, a large Russian tech firm. Unisoftware has a number of important clients, the Federal Tax Service, the Ministry of Finance of the Russian Federation, and the Central Bank of Russia among them. And the Kyiv Post said it was able to confirm that some of the data belonged to customers. The National Republican Army declined to say how much secondary access it had achieved, but suggested that it had carried out related attacks against large Russian organizations. Info Security Magazine speculates that one of the secondary targets may have been the retailer DNS, which early this week disclosed a breach and offered reassurance and apologies to its customers. The attack, DNS said, originated outside of Russia. We emphasize that claims by and about the National Republican Army should be treated with caution and skepticism. The organization, control, and even the very existence of the group have reasonably been questioned. That there's some cybercrime going on inside Russia is almost certainly true, on grounds of a priori probability alone, but seeing the hand of a serious organized opposition group in that cybercrime probably involves a good deal of wishful thinking being carried out in the interest of Kyiv. Coming up after the break, Joe Kerrigan describes underground groups using stolen identities and deepfakes. Our guest is Eve Mailer from Forge Rock on consumer identity breaches. Stay with us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Recorded Future. Staying one step ahead of the rapidly evolving threat landscape requires a constant flow of daily intelligence. To stay up to date on everything happening in the world of cybersecurity, join over 50,000 other security professionals who subscribe to the Cyber Daily. With daily email updates on the latest cybersecurity news, top threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, suspicious IP addresses, and more, the Cyber Daily is the first thing security professionals check every morning. To learn more and subscribe for free, go to recordedfuture.com slash cyber dash daily. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. And now, a word from our sponsor, Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, end users. Legacy device management tools like MDMs force disruptive agents onto employee devices that slow performance and treat privacy as an afterthought. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes, Collide notifies your team via Slack when their devices are insecure and gives them step-by-step instructions to solve the issue. Collide can help you build a culture where everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. For IT admins, Collide provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet, whether they're running on Mac, Windows, or Linux. That visibility makes it easier to prove compliance to your auditors, customers, and leadership. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Visit collide.com slash cyberwire daily to find out how. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash cyberwire daily. And we thank Collide for sponsoring our show. Researchers at identity management and security firm ForgeRock recently published their 2022 Consumer Identity Breach Report, detailing the impact data breaches have on consumers across a variety of industries and regions. For details from the report, I spoke with Eve Mailer, Chief Technology Officer at ForgeRock. Here's the scary part for me. It looks to me, in the numbers, like bad actors have learned how to scale. So for one, we had 4.7 billion data records in the U.S. compromised last year. And that is, sad to say, a 37% increase over the previous year. We also saw 297% increase 
in username and password compromises. Uh, and so these are just indicators that, you know, things are sort of accelerating. And I think that's partly pandemic era and partly, you know, the consequences of digital transformation, um, kind of the downsides, and, and partly just, you know, bad actors uh, learning how to kind of automate and scale to, to new heights, if you will. What sorts of things are you tracking in terms of what, uh, what sectors are being targeted here? We were able to look at the financial services industry, healthcare, social media. And one of the things that we noticed was that healthcare was the most targeted industry for the third year in a row. The cost of a retail breach actually jumped up to $3.27 million. That's sort of average per breach. And that is a 63% increase from, from the prior year. Um, and then financial services, the financial services industry saw 10%, maybe only, of all records breached by ransomware attacks, but experienced 22% of all phishing attacks that we saw last year. So there's like some consequences for, you know, industries that are important to all of us. And how do you explain these trend lines? I mean, is, are, are the threat actors getting more sophisticated? Are, are we becoming better at reporting these things? Or is it a mix of all that? Um, there are some imperatives starting to appear on the scene regulatorily to um, require reporting of data breaches. However, that's not something that we can really rely on yet. It's not, you know, something we can say, well, we've, we've caught all of them. We, we can see everything. I think what it indicates is that cyber, uh, cyber criminals are actually figuring out the tools to do what I call a one-two punch. So when you think about the number of credentials, so usernames and passwords from breach one, they can be leveraged by a cyber criminal to perpetrate breaches two, three, four, five. And what they're doing is they're, those subsequent breaches often are, they're more data rich. So I'll just give you some numbers to put this into perspective. We had uh, 45% of breaches last year containing a username and password versus 8% the prior year, which is really significant uh, as an increase. What we saw around data-rich breaches, think about date of birth and um, social security number. We saw 60% of all records breached, including either uh, social security number or date of birth or both, and that nearly doubled from the previous year. So I think it's evidence that we've got credentials, whether they were um, secured through, uh, whether they're exfiltrated through unauthorized access of various sorts, or whether there might have been a more targeted phishing attack, you're seeing those turned into greater power on the part of the bad actors. Hmm. Well, so based on the information that you all have gathered here, what are your recommendations? How do we stem this tide? Well, if cyber criminals are learning how to scale, we need to learn how to scale. And one of the best tools that you can apply is actually artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, heuristic checking. So artificial intelligence is a way that you can start to apply mitigations kind of in machine time versus human time. You know, we all have foibles. We all may be susceptible to social engineering attacks, phishing attacks. Um, so if you can use um, artificial intelligence techniques, so we think of it as, as autonomous, ways to go autonomous. So autonomous identity to, um, is, is our approach for you know, making sure that entitlements aren't overbroad so that you can help prevent lateral movement once a, a, a bad actor is in your system. Um, or autonomous access, which is, is our way of gathering a diverse set of risk signals so that you can then make appropriate authorization decisions. So artificial intelligence is a fantastic tool. That's number one. Number two, credentials are the really weak spot in this picture, usernames and passwords particularly. And the world has changed a bit in the last year or so. We've got tools such as the, the FIDO2 standards, which enable, in the main, passwordless experiences of authentication that mean that if a password exists, it's not exposed as much to bad actors. And in a lot of cases, you can start to get rid of that password in the authentication equation, for example, using a known device. And a lot of people have devices capable of this kind of um, passwordless interaction. And once the credentials are not there to be stolen, 
they can't be leveraged for the increasingly data-rich breaches. Are you optimistic that we can get a hold of this, that we may, we may be headed in the right direction? Yeah, I, I actually think so. I mean, the numbers were not looking good in 2021. At the same time, some of the technologies that have been able to help us uh, mitigate these risks, tackle these risks, have been on the upswing uh, in 2022. So AI, absolutely. Um, you know, we really believe that identity is the right layer for unifying your systems of intelligence, whether it's threat intelligence, fraud intelligence, even customer intelligence. And because you really have to infuse identity into your systems to make those good decisions, whether it's about authorization or even even upsell and cross-sell. Um, and also this move towards passwordless authentication becoming a kind of no compromises solution so that you can have great security and also a great experience that's becoming ever more possible in the modern era so i think i think that we have the tools to do a much better job going forward that's eve mailer from forge rock And joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute and also my co-host over on the Hacking Humans podcast. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Uh, so we talk a lot over on Hacking Humans about uh, scams, of course. And yes, we do. Uh, one of the things that's uh, caught, captured the imagination of, of people uh, around the world is uh, deep fakes. Deep fakes. And uh, I saw some uh, research come by from the folks over at Trend Micro. Yes. There was an article they published titled How Underground Groups Use Stolen Identities and Deep Fakes. What's going on here, Joe? Well, this is a pretty disturbing article, actually. Uh, it starts off talking about uh, famous people, hmm. right? We have been seeing for years now, in fact, the one that comes to mind is the picture of Keanu Reeves, right? Yeah. Uh, there's pictures of him out there, and, and somebody always photoshops a new shirt on him. Okay. Right? <laughs> uh, well, imagine taking that capability, but now you're creating videos of people. Right. Uh, and they're endorsing products which they didn't endorse. And that has actually happened to one of our own here, uh, Chris Sistrug, who is a security uh, person and, and well-known, has a Twitter account, has been uh, deep-faked into advertising and, sh and sh uh, shilling a product that he does not endorse, and, and the deep-fake video is of him saying things he never said. Wow. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a scam product, I think. Yeah. Uh, even if it's a real product, this is remarkably unethical mm -hmm. uh, and probably illegal as well. Elon Musk has been targeted. Uh, there are videos of him endorsing some kind of uh, financial scheme. Mm -hmm. And of course, Elon has never done this. Right. Uh, it's remarkably disturbing. And there are people on these underground forums. There's a, a, great, uh, a great post here that gives you an example of what they're talking about. Popular exchanges like Bitstamp or local coins require a webcam link. Maybe anyone here able to bypass a webcam link and emulate a webcam, use a deep fake? Let me know. We'll pay for your help. Hmm. So these people are looking for ways to essentially emulate a webcam, but instead of sending a video stream of, the, of a webcam, send the video stream of a deep fake. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this is what it's come to now. And this, I, this is going to be possible. I can, this is technically possible right now. This article goes on to talk about how deep fakes can affect existing attacks and monetization schemes. One, uh, they, they list here messenger scams. You know, you're on some messenger application. Somebody can call you, and, and, and a lot of times these have voice and video chat. If somebody can emulate the webcam and just send a deep fake feed, if the deep fake is good enough and fast enough to actually generate these things on the fly, yeah. uh, it can be remarkably deceiving. Right. Uh, business email compromise is another good one. Uh, I want to be careful with the term business email compromise. A lot of times that term gets used as a catch-all. Yeah. And uh, it, when when I say business email compromise, I mean the actual compromising of business accounts, mm -hmm. right? Like your Office 365 account. Remember that your Office 365 account is probably also where maybe you set reset your Zoom credentials, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So if somebody has access to some some deep fake uh, system that can feed into Zoom uh, as a webcam, guess what? They can impersonate uh, the CEO of your company and even be on his account. 
if they've compromised the account. Right, right. And I imagine you could, you know, say that, oh, I'm sorry, the quality isn't better. My connection must be funny right now. Sure. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Sure. Other ways of doing this, making accounts for money laundering, there are all kinds of ways that, you, that people try to verify your identity. So if your identity is faked in a, in a video call and somebody opens an account in your name, they, they may be able to launder money through that. And that may, I don't know if that would cause legal problems for individuals that have been impersonated, but it certainly allows the crime to continue. Yeah. Uh, it can also allow for hijacking of accounts and taking them over. There are two other things in here that I'm not, I'm not really sure how I feel about them. There's, they list blackmail and disinformation campaigns. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is a gate that swings both ways, right? Mm. I can create a deep fake of Dave Bittner doing something horrible. Yeah. Right. And then say I'll, uh, or, and then to go tell the world, look how God awful Dave Bittner is. Right. right. Or <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe, maybe I go out and do something that's terrible. And Dave goes, look how bad Joe is. And I go, that was a deep fake. Don't oh, believe it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. So now I have a uh, plausible deniability here. Mm, interesting. Uh, so there, there are also uh, social engineering attacks and hijacking of internet of things devices. Like your, if, you know, if somebody can, can fake my voice, they might be able to use my Google assistant. Right. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, uh, good for them, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if they want to try that, that's fine. Here's something that's really interesting. And I feel kind of a little bit vindicated here, Dave. For years, I have been saying that uh, biometrics are not good as a means of verification of a person because they are immutable. Okay. Right? And here we are now looking at uh, deep fakes that are, that are impersonating this. Mm. So your information is already out there for what you look like. Uh, if that information is leaked, you have no way of changing that information. There's mm -hmm. nothing you can do. You can sit there all you want and, and grunt and grunt and groan, but your face will never change from what it looks like. <laughs> right, right. Right? So I, I tend, I think I feel a little bit of vindication reading this article, and that's that's the one upside. But everything else in here is just downside. <laughs> what are some of the recommendations here that they have? Uh, excellent question. One, multi-factor authentication approach for uh, for just about everything. Yeah. Uh, particularly of your financial accounts, and and I say use a hardware token. Uh, preferably one from the FIDO Alliance, or maybe using, uh, if, you, if you're up for it, using some kind of private key, public key, or zero-knowledge proof-based authentication like Squirrel. Uh, any of those are great. Those are very hard to duplicate and impersonate, and uh, they're not biometric. One of the things they say here is organizations should authenticate the user with three basic factors, something the user has, something the user knows, and something the user is, uh, and make sure those something items are chosen wisely. Personnel training done with relevant samples. Uh, you know, the know your customer principle for financial organizations is very important. Deep fake technology is not perfect. Uh, there are certain red flags in an organization the staff should look for. I think that's an okay recommendation for now. Those red flags that are noticeable by people are going to go away very quickly. Mm. Uh, those deep fake technologies are going to improve. Uh, and what needs to happen is there needs to be a technical solution in here because actually deep fakes are pretty easy to spot from a technical standpoint, hmm. at least right now. Yeah. Um, so you can, you can have something in the middleware that is looking at the video feed to say, there's a good chance this video feed is being altered or not genuine, mm -hmm. right? Social media users uh, should limit the exposure of high quality personal images. I don't know how how much of a good help that is. I mean, if the information's already out there, right? I mean, you can go out and shut it down, but somebody already has it, right? Uh, I keep my Facebook account locked down so nobody can see it, and yeah. all of my profile pictures are not of me. But if you're at a friend's birthday party and they right. post pictures of the group, you yeah. know, there you go, there yeah. you are. And yeah. someone takes a high resolution picture of you with your hand up, they can actually get your fingerprint off that. We've right. seen research on that already. Yeah. For verification of sensitive accounts, for example, bank or corporate profiles, users should prioritize the use of biometric patterns that are less exposed to the public like irises and fingerprints. Mm -hmm. Again, I say if that information is ever breached, then that information can be simulated as well. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's information you can't change. Right. right. Uh, significant policy changes are required to address the problem on a larger scale. Uh, these policies should address the use of current and previously exposed biometric data, like I just talked about, and they must also take into account the state of cyber criminal activities and how to prepare for the future. Uh, that's that's a good recommendation, preparing for the future. 
there needs to be at some way, at some point in time, we're going to have to move beyond all of this stuff. And we're going to have to go into some uh, identity verification system uh, that has revocable identities that are demonstrated by physical presence somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think there's ways to do that. I I don't think that's um, impossible. I think that we could we could find lots of ways to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, it's interesting research. Again, this is from the folks over at Trend Micro. Uh, It's titled How Underground Groups Use Stolen Identities and Deep Fakes. Uh, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, David. This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by CrowdSec. CrowdSec helps rebalance the asymmetrical cybersecurity industry by making their open-source multiplayer firewall available to all for free. Once threats are identified, all users are notified to ensure everyone's protection. No matter what your business size, CrowdSec offers adaptive response to credential stuffing, port scans, password brute forcing, and much more. At CrowdSec, they have each other's backs and make the internet safer together. Visit crowdsec.net to learn more. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The Cyberwire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing Cyberwire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Liz Irvin, Rachel Gelfand, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Catherine Murphy, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now, a word from our sponsor, Alert Logic. The defining characteristic of a managed detection and response service is its focus on delivering a meaningful security outcome, meant to ease both pre-breach and post-breach concerns. Maximum visibility and the ability to detect and respond to threats combines with capabilities to minimize the impact of vulnerabilities, configuration issues, and attacks. An effective MDR solution must address both. Alert Logic is the only MDR provider that delivers comprehensive coverage for public clouds, SaaS, on premises, and hybrid environments. Their cloud native technology and white glove team of security experts protect your organization 24 7 and ensure you have the most effective response to resolve whatever threats may come. Alert Logic is the industry's first SaaS MDR provider with purpose-built technology and security experts that help identify and respond to cybersecurity breaches, providing complete compliance solutions that give customers peace of mind and deliver on best practices. Learn more about how Alert Logic's MDR can provide complete coverage for your most critical assets at alertlogic.com. That's alertlogic.com. And we thank Alert Logic for sponsoring our show. 